So on our panel today, we have Jane Shea. Jane has been working on data privacy issues since the late 1990s and currently leads the firm's data privacy and security team. She is an IAPP certified privacy professional. Kevin Shook. Kevin is a partner in our Columbus office practicing business litigation. He specializes in advice to clients on legal issues related to media, technology, and privacy. And finally, Matt Wagner. Matt is an employment attorney in our Cincinnati office. He handles all aspects of employment litigation and counseling, and he is particularly interested in the impact of artificial intelligence in the employment and human relations arena. But before we get to our panel, a little background about artificial intelligence. Every day we hear more and more about artificial intelligence and what it can do. When we say artificial intelligence or AI, what we're really talking about are some machine learning algorithms that can assist and in some cases even replace human decision making in everything from medical diagnoses to investment strategy to building design. Indeed, the uses are growing every day. As an aside, one of the more creative uses is a new chatbot called Do Not Pay that through automated responses to your questions will try to get you out of parking tickets. The growing use of AI has also become a subject of debate between and among such luminaries as Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking, who believe that AI could cause serious disruption and even start a war. Hawking went so far as to say the development of full AI could spell the end of the human race. This group believes that strong national and international oversight of AI is critical. On the other side of the argument are folks like Mark Zuckerberg, CEO of Facebook, who stresses the benefits of AI in such things as medical diagnoses to self-driving cars. Zuckerberg believes AI is and will ultimately be a boon to society. In thinking about artificial intelligence, it's important to see how quickly this has progressed. In the 1940s, Alan Turing helped crack the Enigma machine, which was the Nazi encryption device, which at the time was considered unbreakable. You may have seen this depicted in the movie The Imitation Game. Turing did this by coming up with the idea of programmable machines or computers. Before this, computer-like machines were pretty limited in what they could do. In the 1950s, a scientist named John McCarthy actually coined the phrase artificial intelligence and tried to create a computer that could play checkers better than a human. In the 1960s, IBM created a computer called Luke that was ultimately able to to beat a world chess champion, which at the time was thought to be the ultimate intelligence kind of game. And in 2011, another IBM computer called Watson beat Ken Jennings, a world champion at Jeopardy. This was a big development because it meant the computer was now able to understand language and nuanced questions and could deliver an actual response. Watson did this by machine learning. Then in January of 2016, an AI system developed by Google called DeepMind beat the world's best player in a game called Go. Go is one of the more complex games ever devised, and it's been said that there are more moves in Go than atoms in the universe. So for a computer to win, it had to learn how to play the game, not just catalog every move in response, and then search for the right answer like it would do in a game like chess. So we're really looking at only about 75 years of progression here. And when you compare this to, say, flight, which took some 400 years from Leonardo da Vinci's drawings to the Wright brothers' flying machine, you see how quickly this has developed. And the advances are now getting faster and more impactful. Why? The computer and microchip powers are roughly doubling every year, of so, year or so. This is the famous Moore's Law that many of you have probably heard of. Secondly, we have more and more data to use to assist in the machine learning by computers, hence the rapid advancement. So what exactly is AI? AI has been called the branch of computer science that tries to give computers human-like abilities like learning, speech, vision, and language. Looking at these one at a time, learning, traditional computers had to be programmed to do a task, that is, given specific instructions on how to accomplish it. Now, though, we are programming machining, machines to actually learn. They do this from looking at data and historical examples. The machine looks at a question and the correct answer and then looks at thousands of other questions and correct answers to learn the correlation between the two. 
Once it does that, then it can apply that correlation to questions that it has not seen before. By the way, the human brain is made up of billions of neurons, and with advances in medical imaging, we now know that these connections between these neurons help us learn. Computer scientists have been able to create artificial neurons to help machines learn in a simpler fashion. But in order for a machine to learn, it needs lots and lots of data. Speech. Siri, Google, Cortana, these all use these artificial neural networks. Now, this technology has now gotten pretty good. The error rate is actually very small once the machine learns your voice and inflection. What about vision? AI has also gotten pretty good at understanding what is going on in an image. AI programs can now view an image and translate that image into discernible sentences and concepts. And finally, and most importantly, written and oral language. Traditionally, computers could look at a sentence only as a collection of independent words. It could not pick up meaning or context. This is your standard word search. Word search. Now computers can understand language in ways like humans. An example of this is the automatic grammar connection and word choice tool in Microsoft Word. So the vast amount of unstructured data, that is data not in a computerized format, is now searchable and understandable to a computer. All of these factors and developments are why you are hearing so much about AI these days and the debates, fears, and promises of it. But it's important to keep in mind that there are limitations of AI. It requires lots of data and learning and there's always issues about quality and amount of data that is robust. And the very best results thus far have always been when AI and humans work together. Human and AI combinations always give better results than the human or AI acting alone. So we are not yet at the age of Blade Runner or the Terminator, Terminator no matter what you have heard. So with that backdrop, I want to turn it over to our panel. First, uh, let me ask you, Jane, how does the use of automatic intelligence uh, impact individuals' privacy rights? What is the nature of personal data that is being collected? Well, Steve, you alluded to the importance of collecting and using data in order for artificial intelligence um, uh, products to, to function optimally. And so it, I think it's particularly uh, instructional to think of the data collected and the privacy rights with regard to that data in the context of consumer products, because there you are looking at personal data significantly, uh, maybe more so than um, data collected to operate uh, a machine um, in the manufacturing world. And so if we think in terms of um, interactive toys, uh, uh, such as Talking Barbie and, and Talking Unicorns out there, uh, as well as uh, self-driving vehicles, the, the uh, product has to collect data about the individual who is operating the the machine or playing with the toy and in terms of um, even starting with the creation of a user account where you provide your name your date of birth your address maybe some photographs in, in um, the case of the toys and then beyond that the usage data such as voice messages conversation re recordings uh, past and real-time physical locations and these products all function because they're connected to the internet. So any product that connects to the internet is subject to being hacked. And so we should be concerned about the data collection practices that the manufacturers of these products are utilizing. It's a, a good point, Jane, and it's particularly important when you when you think about all of the devices around us these days that are generating data. Uh, your, your television set at home, your uh, car, uh, all the Internet of Things devices that are out there, and 
many times the data collection practices of, of the developers of those devices are not robust, and often their patchwork or any flaws or security breaches are not as robust as they should. That's exactly so, so, right. And there's there's a rush to market for these products, and they they're often made in China or Hong Kong or Taiwan, where the uh, regulations are not uh, as robust in other countries such as the European Union. And as a matter of fact, some of these products are outlawed in the European Union solely because their data collection, the lack of transparency and the lack of informed the opportunity for informed consent um, in connection with the sensitive data that is collected. It was interesting, um, this summer, the um, FBI issued a public service announcement about internet connected toys and the privacy and contact concerns for children. Uh, children in particular are, are vulnerable because they are um, naturally curious and um, uh, have their guards down. And so there's a real risk for misuse when you think that about the fact that it collects GPS locations and visual identifiers, which is biometric data, um, known interests, it can garner trust. So someone with um, uh, uh, nefarious um, goals could um, easily, uh, you know, harm a child or or put a child child in harm's way. Um, just by playing with one of these toys. It's uh, particularly important because, as I said before, artificial intelligence or machine learning requires a tremendous amount of data in order to correlate uh, answers and questions and, and then apply that to, to new situations. And us humans uh, can, can make those correlations and see patterns with relatively small amounts of data uh, and do it very accurately. But computers can't do that without, without tons of data, hence more and more concern. Uh, let me ask Jane this, you this question. Um, as a privacy expert and a practitioner, you heard me reference uh, Elon Musk and uh, 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 Stephen Hawking and the concern about regulation. What, what are your thoughts about regulation of artificial intelligence. Is it coming? What 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 should we expect in terms of, of privacy and, and those kinds of regulations? Well, we're already seeing industry groups step forward with uh, proposals for regulations. And um, just this uh, couple of uh, months ago, the an organization, a data watchdog called the World Forum for Harmonization of vehicle regulations issued guidelines on cybersecurity and data protection and the context of um, automated vehicles. And they drew on other industries as examples of best practice solution, solutions such as pay TV broadcasting and um, evidently digital radio, or excuse me, digital police radio um, that restrict access to information. They encourage privacy by design so that the um, concepts of protecting transparency and consent are built into uh, the design of the products and thus reduce public anxiety about them. Uh, the Department of the US Department of Transportation issued a version two of their uh, guidelines for industry, um, for the automotive industry, and in particular, uh, automated vehicles. And the focus of this second version was uh, almost exclusively on the safety features. And so I think what the um, privacy advocates are hoping to see, and they do uh, indicate that the Department of Transportation indicates that there will be a version three out within the next year as well. And I think their um, privacy advocates are hoping that that version three will 
also address privacy and security concerns. So up to this point, what we're seeing is more in the form of a guidance rather than an actual regulation. But um, the, the European Union, I guarantee you, will the, the current data privacy directive applies to these products and the GDPR will apply, apply to these products as well. And so that those um, privacy protections in the European law will have to be taken into consideration with respect to any products that are um, sold in the European, in the European market. Um, one last thing um, as well is that the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act has recently amended its guidance to include internet connected toys as a um, topic or a means of collecting children's information that is subject to COPPA. So it's not limited to computer applications, which is sort of the general concept um, when one thinks of the applicability of COPPA. Good point, Jane. I think it's we all recognize in this arena the the constant tension that we have between privacy and convenience because all of us have probably traded away more privacy than we ever thought and frequently traded away without thinking about it because the convenience of what we're getting back is is so great. So uh, you you bring up some some. Uh, you mentioned guidance as opposed to regulation, which which brings up some some ethical issues. And I wanted to, to Kevin ask you. Um, we we hear a lot about uh, such things as algorithm uh, algorithmic bias uh, um, and data overfitting. Uh, tell us, comment if you would on on how we might be able to make sure that decisions made by artificial intelligence, intelligent programs will be fair and, and be just to all of us. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, yeah, uh, AI, artificial intelligence can only be as effective as the data it relies upon. And algorithmic bias refers to um, uh, the data that is uh, embedded into these algorithms. Right now we have um, all kinds of proprietary algorithms that are already being used to make decisions um, that affect our daily life. Um, who gets interviewed for a job? Who gets hired for a job? Who gets a loan? Uh, who gets parole? Um, in the criminal justice system, for example, um, there are some artificial intelligence um, tools being looked at and being used uh, for judges. Um, for sentencing and uh, predicting risk of, uh, of uh, uh, folks that have been uh, convicted of a crime, the risk that they'll, they'll uh, come back and do it again. And uh, if you, uh, ProPublica did an article on, on the criminal justice angle, and it found that, um, that the risk scoring tool uh, used uh, by some judges uh, for uh, predicting uh, future criminal activity uh, was racially biased. Um, and it was partly because uh, we presently have a um, criminal justice system that uh, incarcerates more individuals who happen to be African American than whites. And so um, if you start uh, plugging data into an algorithm, um, that shows more African Americans um, being uh, convicted of crimes, there's the uh, risk that that algorithm will uh, then act to predict in the future that uh, African Americans or any other race uh, may be more likely to engage in criminal activity or mo more likely to re-engage in criminal activity. And so, um, it's a concern uh, that that you know past um, past data uh, may inherently include some bias, and by using that past data to predict future events, you may uh, 
as a result, perpetuate that bias. Um, and another example um, is using algorithms and artificial intelligence and in hiring practices. Um, if you are screening applicants and using data of uh, past applicants who have been hired um, to predict who you should hire in the future, um, you may end up with an algorithm that uh, perpetuates a bias or results in hiring decisions uh, where you have um, predicting uh, success uh, based on uh, hiring folks that look just like um, those who you've hired in the past. So it, using past data um, in an algorithm uh, could, could perpetuate a bias and uh, prevent uh, the growth of diversity within a company. And so those are the types of things and, and examples of algorithmic bias that um, are a concern and, and, and trying to get good data and, and plugging it into the algorithm in, in the best way possible is going to be uh, critically important. Yeah, it's, it's the classic uh, overfitting problem. Uh, you could have an AI program look at all sorts of traffic accidents and it, it might conclude from that that more orange cars are an accident than any, in accidents than any other color. But that really has no predictive value because that you know, obviously doesn't mean orange cars cause accidents. And we see the same sort of bias frequently in the sentencing guidelines or in hiring practices, and that, that's a real issue. Uh, Kevin, let me ask you this. Heretofore, uh, the, as I said, the best solutions seem to be from when humans and artificial intelligence work together uh, to help control some of those biases. But it's conceivable we could get to the point, maybe in the not so distant future, where uh, data overfitting problems or algorithmic bias can be uh, can be accounted for in the computer program. How How is artificial intelligence going to impact uh, the job situation uh, and what might be, be done about that? So, yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's a real concern that, you know, um, it used to be the concern that uh, artificial intelligence was just going to um, take assembly line jobs. Um, but you know, it, it's 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 more than that, and and um, it, it's a concern for for really everybody, uh, professionals including lawyers. Um, there was a large law firm uh, recently that um, hired um, a uh, an offshoot of Watson um, to into their bankruptcy practice, um, and this um, robot lawyer. Um, can uh, answer uh, research questions um, and in, in a conversational uh, way and can uh, automatically update the answers to those questions uh, without even being asked. Um, so, you know, that's, that's an example of, of a, not just being, you know, you know, assembly line type work, but actual creative uh, work that used to be done by professionals um, <coughs> being replaced um, by automation. And there are some estimates uh, that indicate that, that about 50% of current jobs will be lost to automation in 20 years. And I think the answer to it is going to be education. Um, our ch children uh, and us, uh, learning is a, is a lifelong uh, a lifelong process and, and our, our children and, and us, we're going to need to continue to stay smarter than the bots and uh, learn learn technology and learn creative and artistic skills um, that, that are needed in this uh, new uh, economy. I was, I was reading just this morning about uh, the likelihood that we will have uh, autonomous trucks in the very near future uh, to deliver goods across the country. And uh, it was lamenting that that could result in a lot of jobs lost in the trucking industry. However, the new model would be for 
the the a, a, a human to be sitting at a computer in an office that would then navigate the last few miles of a truck's journey when it had to get off interstates and get onto uh, city streets and that that human would be a replacement for one of the truckers. So that remains to be seen. Let me let me turn you, Kevin, to uh, media and politics. There's been a lot of uh, buzz around, quote, fake news, unquote. What's AI's impact, if any, on uh, on the on the media and and, and uh, politics? Yeah, uh, news is increasing increasingly uh, for us coming from social media, uh, which can be a wonderful thing. I mean, we we can get news faster through Twitter. Um, news can be generated by everyday citizens with a camera phone that are out and about um, on the scene, uh, immediately posting videos or images and, and commenting on them. Um, so we're, we're, you know, informed through social media 24 hours a day. Um, the, the automated news uh, can also filter out and tailor, a, a, you know, news specific to a reader's interest, um, which also can be a good thing. You know, if I want every morning to get specifically Cleveland Browns news, and I don't want to get Pittsburgh Steelers news, I can make sure that that is um, delivered directly to me, as bad as that news might be. Um, I was going to say, that would be a sad way to start your day. <laughs> well, it's how I start my day, unfortunately. Um, the concern is that you can be filtering out um, those diverging opinions uh, from those opinions that diverge from your own, and that AI can be used to misinform and manipulate public opinion. Um, there was a study done uh, by the University of South, uh, Southern California that analyzed um, Twitter during the last three presidential debates, and it found that 20% of all political tweets were made by bots, uh, not, not by real people, you know, tweeting. And so the bots um, can make the on online conversations not only more polarized, um, but they can make it easier to, spe to spread factually incorrect news. Um, and they can make it seem as though uh, public opinion is overwhelmingly uh, one way uh, when that may not be accurate. Um, if you've got a bot um, that can create tweets from all different faces, accounts all over the world that's repeatedly in different ways uh, expressing the same opinion, um, one can can start to believe that, that this these opinions are, are, are you know, the, the most widely held opinions, and maybe I should start uh, thinking, uh, thinking that way, or, or maybe I should look at, at this more closely. I never, never thought, uh, never agreed with that, but um, everybody else seems to be thinking this, so, you know, it can manipulate us, and, um, I, you know, I, I was shocked to hear that, that, um, that study, 20% of all political tweets during the presidential debates were made by bots, so that's a scary thing. That is, that is quite scary, and, uh, so, you know, as a, as a litigator listening to this, you know, I always think, well, what happens when artificial intelligence fails and and who's going to be liable for that? So, Matt, let me turn to you on that uh, and ask this question. Are, are there existing liability theories that are that are adequate or appropriate to uh, to address uh, harm that might be caused by complex and autonomous decision making AI? Thanks, Steve. Well, yeah, there there is an existing framework that works for us now, but I think it's worth going through the exercise of what happens as artificial intelligence gets more and more complex, because I don't think our existing theories are necessarily going to work as AI gets more independent and more capable of making decisions uh, and maybe more empowered by, uh, by their creators to make decisions depending on what their task is. So I'd like to kind of, you know, touch on, on where we are. You know, we've got a lot of complex 
uh, robots in industrial settings. And I think that's a good maybe starting point for the conversation because we've got a pretty good framework for what happens when a robot like that injures somebody, right? We look to products liability theories on the one hand in terms of was the robot poorly designed? Was it poorly manufactured? Is there some defect in how it was made or designed that caused an injury? Um, was there some defect in the warnings that the manufacturer, that the creator of the robot gave to the end user so that they were unable to operate it safely? They didn't have the information they needed. Um, and then outside of product liability, you know, the workers' compensation system is a huge part of our answer to what happens when someone gets injured by a robot. Uh, and that's because most robots are in the workplace. They are in, in manufacturing and industrial settings. So we've got the workers' compensation system. We've got workplace safety standards that come about from the Occupational Safety and Health Act. We've got product liability theories. And all these, I think, are adequate to deal with where we are. But if you think about where we're going, it changes the game very dramatically um, on a couple different fronts. For one, we are right on, I think, the bleeding edge of AI that are going to be capable of really making decisions in a way we've never seen or experienced before. So when we're no longer talking about robots designed for a specific task, even if it's a complex task, we have to deal with the idea uh, and grapple with the idea of robots and artificial intelligences that might be doing things that were not intended by their creators uh, and acting in ways that their creators maybe couldn't have foreseen. Uh, and this may not be as far off as we think. There have been some really interesting examples popping up in the media over the past year or two. Uh, a lot of the examples I've seen deal with chatbots. So these are artificial intelligences that you know, Facebook or Google or other companies are trying to create that can interact with humans effectively. Uh, and some of these are, are kind of academic. Some of these are maybe for use in customer service roles or as a frontline customer service before you get elevated to a human. Um, but it's been, there's been some interesting news in how chatbots are behaving in ways completely unforeseen by their creators. Some of this stuff comes back to what Kevin touched on with uh, the idea that where you're getting bad data fed into a chatbot, it's gonna start doing things that maybe are unintended. So for example, there was kind of a notorious example where Facebook, I believe it was Facebook, uh, created a chatbot, they sent it live, it started interacting with users, uh, and then it started making racist comments. Uh, and that was because they were feeding it the data set of all user comments across Facebook. So you get kind of a garbage in, garbage out scenario. Uh, there was a similar example I read about very recently uh, where I believe Google was experimenting with some chatbots in China. And the chatbot started uh, criticizing communism and praising the United States, which obviously did not sit well with the Chinese government, so they had to be deactivated. So we've already seen AI acting in ways that are a bit unanticipated. You know, another angle of this is I've, I've read a lot of articles about how AI are constructed very differently than they used to. You know, a, a computer program used to be a pretty linear thing. It would follow directions and maybe there'd be decisions or branches at some point, but you could look at the program and understand exactly what was going on. The way artificial intelligences, like the ones that play chess, are created now, it's more what's called a neural network. So it's, and Steve, you, you talked about this in the intro, it's, it's all kinds of different connections and circuits being set up that can interact with each other in a way that is intended to approximate a human brain. And one consequence of that is that creators don't always understand exactly what's going on under the hood anymore, which is which is really interesting, but it's also kind of alarming. Uh, the idea that we don't always know exactly how our AI are working anymore, and, and, and also as a consequence, you know, where they're going and what kinds of decisions they might be making. So that's kind of a long-winded way to try to, to try to set up and introduce this conversation. I, th I think the complexity of AI means we need to start thinking beyond our current liability paradigm. And then the other big change that's simpler to get our heads around is just robots aren't gonna be just in the workplace anymore. So workers' compensation is, is a great system for workplace injuries, regardless of the cause, including by machines, by robots, by artificial intelligence. But once AI starts permeating our lives and all aspects of our lives, 
obviously that system falls pretty short. Yeah, I'm I'm reminded, Matt, of the uh, the uh, the Uber litigation uh, out in federal court in California, where the issue was whether an Uber driver is an employee or a general contractor, and uh, Judge Kahn wondered at one point during the hearings whether maybe there ought to be a new category for these drivers. They don't quite meet criteria for employees or for, for independent contractors. But that said, uh, what do you see that, what kind of new sort of liability theories might there be or might there be developed to try to address whatever harms could grow out of autonomous decision-making by computers? Yeah, and I, I think this is an area where we're, academics are starting to kind of wade into this space. You know, to my knowledge, I haven't seen any serious discussion among legislators or states really thinking about this. And, and again, because this is all very new, I think, I think we don't really understand where AI are going and how independent or capable of decision making they might be. But I think this is a useful exercise to think through what kinds of legal regimes we're likely to see in the future. And obviously this could be state by state. We could see states experimenting with different ways to address and grapple with these problems before we come up with some kind of solution that, that seems to work the best. But some of the things I've seen is, you know, we can we can maybe take our existing products liability theories and, and maybe tweak them for AI. And, and the theory there is that, well, if, if you've got an AI that's even one that's independent, even one that's capable of making complex decisions on its own, and it causes harm, maybe we just sort of impute or presume there must be some kind of defect for the AI to have decided to do that. Um, it, to me, it's not really very satisfactory, but that's one idea I've seen floated by some academics. Uh, and to me, that kind of feels almost like a strict liability standard in terms of uh, if there's a machine, if there's an AI and there's harm, well, we're just gonna hold the creator liable. Um, you know, again, to me, that's not necessarily satisfactory. I, I think this is going to be more complex than that and not so black and white. And it also raises the question of, well, if we want to hold the creator liable, who is that? You know, is that the programmers who created the, the neural networks that, if you will, form the brain of this artificial intelligence? Is it the manufacturers or designers of the hardware? Um, do we have to sort out what exactly happened so we can figure out where the blame lies? Is it in the decision making of the machine or in the hardware of the machine? Do we rope component suppliers into this? I think these are all questions that will have to be addressed. You know, from a liability standpoint, one consequence that, that I think we can also see is, is essentially what I would say, what I would call blame the human. Um, and this is easy to think about in the terms of self driving cars. You know, the, Tesla and GM and Google, the, some of the big players in the self-driving car space now, I mean, they're predicting that self-driving cars could be getting into accidents up to 90% or more, uh, fewer than humans do. So, I mean, a huge, massive potential reduction in accidents when we've got self-driving vehicles. To me, that kind of begs the question, well, if you get into an accident and there's a human and a robot, aren't we likely to just blame the human? I mean, are we even going to look into it and, and approach it the same way we used to with traditional negligence uh, theories? Are we going to rely as much on insurance companies when we have uh, you know, a large percentage of the cars out there not really getting into accidents anymore? And it may just be imposing more and more costs on humans as opposed to the creators of AI. So kind of two very different approaches, one pushing costs onto the people that we're gonna sort of blame for these accidents. One, pushing costs back onto the AI creators, depending on what happens. Um, and I think another interesting thing to think about that I, I haven't really seen written about much, but this is an idea that I think is worth exploring is, what about something like an expanded version of the workers' compensation system? And, you know, it's, there's a lot of ways that that could look, but one way might be to have some kind of recurring annual tax on the robots, on the AI that is incurred by the uh, creators or by the by the retail sellers or or what have you, whoever makes sense, and that creates a pool of money that then 
pays out compensation to those injured by AI. You know, the whole point of the workers' comp system is for us not to have to fight about every single injury. Uh, and this could be something similar, but we'd have to expand it out beyond the workplace. Um, you know, it's kind of a similar vein also to something Steve, you and that Kevin brought up earlier, which is employees being replaced by robots. And one of the potential ways to deal with that that's been floated by Elon Musk and others is a robot tax. Uh, and, and typically this is thought of in the context of universal income, which is a little outside the scope of this presentation, but that's that's one of the, the potential, you know, theories that's been floated to deal with the impacts of robots on employment. We, we have uh, all sorts of, of nuances to it, to, to, to your comments. And, you know, one of the main ones is that, you know, artificial intelligence and technology is so rapidly changing that for the, the it'll be difficult for the law to, to keep up. Uh, Kevin, let me, let me turn back to you on that note. Uh, there's quite a debate, as, as I mentioned, uh, about regulation in this space. Uh, um, and do we need rules for robots, sort of like those that uh, Isaac Asimov proposed in the book, I, Robot, way back in 1939? Uh, talk to us a little bit about uh, what laws that we currently have that are regulating AI and uh, what the general principles are. Sure, sure. We do have some laws now um, that, that uh, regulate artificial intelligence, even though that wasn't the law's original intent. Um, you know, we have uh, robocalling laws um, that uh, prohibit pre, pre, pre-recorded pre te- telemarketing calls um, unless the marketer has the consumer's prior written authorization. We have the Can Spam Act that um, uh, says that emails should mislead recipients um, over the source and the content, um, and that, that the recipients have a, a, a right to opt out and decline those e- emails going forward. Um, both of those types of laws um, <clears throat> can prevent the you know the automated spamming or the automated calling um, of of folks uh, for marketing purposes. Uh, we've got the Computer uh, Fraud and Abuse Act. Um, that covers um, unauthorized access uh, or modification of computer uh, material, and and you know that 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 can impact automated uh, hacking uh, and automated uh, misconduct uh, with respect to uh, manipulating folks' computers. Um, there's there's a, a, a proposal right now um, to a, a to, to regulate high frequency trading, uh, which is something that um, uh, traders on the stock market are are using to uh, uh, spoof and flash trade, um, and there's a there's a process called quote stuffing um, that uh, using artificial intelligence. Um, very smart people are out there making a lot of money. Um, um, automating trading in a way to, to uh, leverage in their favor. And so um, regulators are addressing things right now. Um, just generally, I don't think there'll ever be, you know, some omnibus artificial intelligence act. I suppose there could be, but I think it's going to be, you know, industry by industry, um, you know, targeting specifically automated cars or, or targeting uh, a specific problem uh, where artificial intelligence comes up. Some some general principles I think are are that you know we're going to have to modify current laws um, that already exist um, to make sure it applies to artificial intelligence or to the operator or creator of our artificial intelligence. If decisions are being made by a robot, you know who's responsible and, and so there's already you know laws in the book related to cyber bullying stock market manipulation terrorist threats discrimination and things like that and so we're going to have to make sure that that the laws uh, preventing humans from doing bad things 
also prevent the creators or operators of artificial intelligence from doing uh, or, or setting forth a process that does the same thing. Um, some other principles, uh, disclosure, um, you know, the lines can be blurred uh, so that we're not sure um, if we're talking to a human or a robot. And you, know, you can envision laws that, that require disclosure um, if you are talking uh, to a robot versus a human. It, it becomes obvious a lot of times right now uh, when you get a, a robot uh, te telephonic uh, communication. Uh, it may not be as obvious in the future. Uh, it becomes less obvious when you're getting communications by text or something like that. And, and disclosure uh, may be uh, something that's going to be legislated at some point. Jane talked about privacy earlier in this presentation. Obviously, the use and protection of data that this that artificial intelligence is collecting, whether it's with respect to automated cars, you know, collecting every bit of data as you drive down the road, or you know, any other use, uh, it, it, there there could be laws saying that that information can't be collected and disclosed without consent. Um, so those are the types of things, um, generally, uh, principles that that can guide us as we uh, are, are regulating artificial intelligence. Are there are there some specific proposals on the table right now for for regulating AI? Sure. Um, you know, with respect to automated cars, um, uh, the you know the, the classic question that that everyone's talking about. Um, is is you know if you've got a if you've got a car driving down the road and, and it's about to get in a crash and and there's a choice between you know swerving uh, away from the pedestrian and slamming into the berm and putting uh, the driver and the passengers at risk versus hitting the passenger, um, what what choice is the automated vehicle going to make? And um, it's an interesting question, um, and, and the decision that the automated cars will make will depend on 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 what you know what is plugged into the algorithm. And um, some folks have talked to, about with respect to automated cars, um, uh, sort of an FDA drug approval process, just like how um, the FDA approves drugs um, before before we put automated cars on the market uh, um, there you know th there should be preclinical trials and testing in simulated environments before the government gives its blessing to say that this particular car or this particular transportation uh, vehicle is uh, is uh, allowed to go to market um, Germany has issued guidelines specifically with respect to the question of you know, what decision does does a vehicle make when when faced uh, with a crash? And, and the guidelines uh, include, first of all, that human life should be the top priority over damage to property or animals. Um, that there needs to be no distinction between humans. You can't have the car deciding, well, I'm going to hit the older person instead of the younger person, or you know, there can be no distinction as to gender, uh, physical or mental characteristics. It, it has to be um, uh, no distinction at all. And uh, the drivers have to have control over vehicle data. Um, so talking about the data collection before they have to, you know, give consent before their data can be used. Um, and it must be clear who is responsible, either a human or a computer for each task and always documented who is who is driving uh, or who is the passenger in, a, in an automated vehicle. So Germany is in the process of, you know, looking at this already. Um, and, and uh, you know, there, there will be other uh, markets, but the, the, this is the automated car uh, regulation is, is on the top of everybody's mind because it really seems to be right on the horizon. Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting dilemma. Uh, if you have no standards, you could, you could have, for example, an Apple automated car deciding that 
as between slamming into an Apple customer or slamming into an Android customer, we'll pick the Android. Um, so clearly, there's there's going to be some needs from this need for standards. We do have some uh, audience questions, so so let me uh, let me pose some of those. Um, the first one uh, is you mentioned uh, disclosure with respect to the collection and uh, use of data. What issues we, we've all seen uh, uh, all these long-winded privacy policies that you have to click to agree to in order to use an app. What are the issues associated with that, and is there such a thing as informed consent? Uh, Jane, can can you comment on that from maybe a privacy standpoint? Sure. Um, the there's been um, developments in the privacy um, industry uh, in terms of what that should look like. And first of all, the idea of disclosures that what they call just in time disclosures that it's not a matter of um, scrolling, you know, having to scroll all the way through um, the terms of use or the privacy policy at your leisure, but that they are presented to the user before they can actually activate the, um, the product. And so the, that concept of just in time combined with, and to the, to the point of the question of informed consent, providing disclosures that are um, easy to read, easy to understand, um, there is a what they call a layered um, privacy policy, an approach to privacy policies in which they, um, and if you look at some of the larger um, Silicon Valley um, organizations, they use that, Procter & Gamble uses it, but they'll just kind of bold face um, simple statements that say, we use your, you know, we collect um, the data that you provide us, um, such as with some examples, and we use it for, uh, in order to operate and make the product we provide to you um, function optimally. And um, hopefully it says things like, we don't share this with third parties. Um, and you can ask us to delete it. So, you know, you have the whole issue of the autonomous vehicles. And if that vehicle is sold to another buyer, it's sold with your data intact because it's going to be tied to the VIN. So shouldn't there be some opportunity to delete your driving habits and your um, sensitive data from that vehicle or from uh, this um, connected from that VIN. So that those would be um, two things that I think might be a um, serviceable approach to disclosure and to informed consent. Uh, relatedly, probably a question for you, Matt. Uh, are we getting closer to a almost a warnings type standard that we used to see and or still see in products liability litigation in connection with uh, disclosures for use of data and holding of data that, that Jane was discussing? In terms of use of data, um, you, know, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure how we're going to go. Like we talked about earlier, we, people don't generally read the terms and conditions even though we, as you pointed out, tend to sign away huge amounts of privacy. So I think is the, I think that for me, the biggest consequence of the proliferation of collection of data by artificial intelligence and internet connected devices is just that it's gonna be that many more opportunities for data to get stolen and misappropriated. So I, I'm almost less, you know, for me personally, and obviously I'm not a data privacy expert like Jane is, but I'm less interested in the consequences of legal disclosure and more about the illegal uses and the greater opportunities that this brave new world is going to present for nefarious actors. Um, and what that means in terms of identity theft and maybe needing additional regimes just to protect ourselves collectively. 
from nefarious uses of our data because I, I feel like events over the past couple of years, uh, you know, the major breaches we've seen in the news, the Equifax breach being one of the largest and one that's on our minds right now, just show that the existing structures we have to protect people against identity theft and um, their bank account information being hacked are, are sort of barely adequate right now. Uh, and, and the more opportunities there are for people to have their data misappropriated, the more that's going to be be a problem. Um, I mean, in terms of legal uses, though, and, and disclosures, I think we're you know, we're probably going to be in a similar similar world where the the power is with those collecting the data. The law looks at it from a standpoint of well, they told you what they were going to do. It, it's up to you to read the terms and conditions, even though they're lengthy and, and complex, and so few of us do. Um, and I'm not sure. I see that changing in the near future. Probably have time for the one one more question, and and it is, uh, uh, are we entitled to know the assumptions and algorithms being used by an artificial intelligence program, and how can we find out for anyone? Well, I'm happy to start off quickly. I I think that's a great question, um, and, and to me, it kind of comes back to you know what I touched on earlier in terms of I don't know if that's possible um, I think for now it still is the idea that we can understand it and you know self-driving cars are a great example can we get access to how those decisions are being made I think on a macro level like Kevin talked about with regulation in terms of you know how does a machine make decisions in the event of a crisis or an accident situation um, certainly after the fact it's going to be important to know what the machine did, but I think I think there's going to need to be some public disclosure in terms of how machines that are being more integrated in our lives are making these autonomous decisions. But you can envision maybe in the not so distant future machines where we are just simply not equipped to understand exactly what's going on and therefore not equipped to be able to disclose that to people, even if we think they have a right to know. So I think that's a really interesting question and um, definitely something worth more thought. Well, on that note, I think uh, we've kind of reached the end of our designated time. Uh, I want to thank uh, the, the panelists. Uh, it was really great conversation, really interesting subject matter, and certainly want to thank all the attendees. Again, a recording of this uh, webinar will be on the Frost Brown Todd website if anybody wants to, to listen to it. Uh, and if anybody has additional questions or thoughts or would just like to chat about that, uh, feel free to contact uh, any one of us. Uh, all of us are keenly interested in artificial intelligence and what the future may hold and uh, would certainly be glad to, to chat at any time with any of you. So thanks everyone very much and I uh, hope everyone has a good afternoon.